What's up, everybody? OCD Mikey, Hi-Fi Guy, and today I am going to tell you all, we're going to go on to a little exploration about the Class AB stereo amps, and mainly we're going over, um, you know, the, the big ones, okay? So anything over 200 watts per channel. Over here, we have the Viola Labs Cadence, which is a 200 watt per channel Class AB behemoth, big pole pig, if you will. We've got the Donizetti uh, Audio Analog made in Italy that is 250 watts per channel. And then up here we've got the Jeff Rowland 625S2, which is 325 per channel. Uh, and uh, we're looking at 35, 14, and 18.5 before it was discontinued. If this came back now, it would be at least 20,000. Um, and I'm going to show these to you. We're going to look at some different things. We're going to do an in-depth, uh, sort of a, um, look at class AB power amps for audio and sort of what they are all about. Okay. So before I go into this video, uh, about the amps, I want to give you a little bit of background. Okay. Um, because I think you, you, you need to know the distinction between when I'm bringing some information about amplifiers versus just anybody else that you view on YouTube. This is the part where I say, do your background, do your homework, check out who's bringing you the information. I used to own an amplifier manufacturer. Okay, so what I mean by that is your boy Mikey bought a long-standing California company called AB International originally was AB Systems, which was an amplifier company created by Bob Bird and George Anderson uh, of Alltech Lansing. Okay, these are two guys that Nelson Pass used to work with. Um, uh, Doug Dale, most likely, of CODA worked in our new Bob Bird and uh, George Anderson because they all existed in the same area. There were a lot of amps that were made up around Sacramento area, it was there was a little pocket of audio electronics that were made up there and some still are. So this was an existing company. What I mean is I came there, there's a building, there's several levels of parts bins, there's a forklift, there's employees, there is parts and stuff like you wouldn't believe. I mean, trailer loads of stuff and amplifiers and test benches and scopes and engineers and all this stuff. Well, I bought the thing lock, stock, and barrel, okay? What I did over the next two years after buying that company is I got my ass handed to me, okay? But we might say Mikey went to the school of hard knocks. That means I learned what it's like to run an American manufacturer of amplifiers, one that's already established, okay? Not just trying to do something out of home. I'm talking about a complete commercial location with a building, like I said, in a warehouse and a forklift and employees, okay? Um, and during that time, okay, we're making class AB power amplifiers. It was called AB International. It was Anderson and Bird, class AB. It kind of all went together. These are very long-standing amps that were very, very, very well built. Um, if you remember a company called Cinepro, uh, uh, AB International made all the Cinepro amps. Um, the, you might know, well, you won't know Jerry Steckling and JSX, but uh, I sold, I think it was 14 or 18 amplifiers into George Lucas Industrial Light and Magic on the Presidio in San Francisco. They were the amplifiers that we built and we put Jerry's name on the front, JSX, and I've got pictures, I'll probably dig some up and show you guys, of racks of my amplifiers, and I sold the job into Industrial Light and Magic. We were in professional locations, Muddy Waters, um, Frank Zappa used to use Class AB amps, and I've got pictures of Frank holding his, his uh, AB systems, um, what was it that you call those things? Tour jackets. They were like the satin tour jackets in the seventies. Remember that? So Frank Zappa used to use our amps and it was, it's, it's a hell of a brand. It's now gone out. I got out by the hair of my chin. I sold to the guy that was stuffing the board. There's no way I ever want to own a manufacturer again. I learned firsthand what it's like soup to nuts to run an American manufacturer of electronics. And I used to sit with Tim over his shoulder, looking over his shoulder 
watching him make the circuits, watching him grab, click, and drag, and move the traces and make the Gerber files. Um, I then had to take the finished Gerber files and I turned them in to a board manufacturer and then I would get them priced out and I would order 100, 200, 300, 500 boards for the power supply, for the output boards, for the input boards. I knew all the different parts of the amplifier. I know the different sections, the input section, the, 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 the output section, the power supply. It's very easy. After a while, you understand how it all goes together. And I gathered all this information and learned it from watching firsthand. I am self-taught. I'm not an engineer. Did not go to school for this. Did not go to school for business, okay? Jumped in the deep end and learned that way. I also learned how the mechanical structure of an amp goes together. I had to buy sheet metal. I could call for whatever gauge of sheet metal I wanted. I always used the fattest, thickest sheet metal and had a beautiful crinkle finish put on it so it was very durable. Um, and I had to buy these parts. So I know how much chassis cost to have them made out of sheet metal. I know the difference between machined aluminum. My face panels, and I'll show you a pic, were massive handles. They made the Vera Star logo. If you've seen my Vera Star logo, it's an inverted triangle with two trapezoids, and that inverted space makes a V. Okay, so my amp had three quarter inch plate glass backlit V in the middle, inverted with two massive trapezoidal handles to hold it. It's the coolest looking thing. And then we had vents behind the handles because there were fans on the back that would suck air through the chassis. The reason for that was these amps were used in racks and they would put stacks of them. So there was really, you needed to draw air in through the front panel, through the amp and out the back um, across the heat sink. The heat sink was on the back. I ordered heat sinks. So I know what an extrusion heat sink, heat, uh, heat sink extrusion is. I know how to buy heat sinks. I know how much they are. I know which ones are regular heat sink profiles and which ones are custom unique heat sink profiles that cost a lot more. The other ones are cut. They just have a long stick and they just cut, cut, cut. Then they take those pieces, put it in a jig, lock it up and then drill out then and, and drill and tap and put whatever you need into that heat sink. And we had the heat sinks across the back where we had three stereo boards on top, one on top of the other across that heat sink. And what you do is you take your output devices, your bipolar output devices, which we use Motorola devices and then on semiconductor. And you put them on there with some little rubber pieces and, and, and heat compound and you screw them onto the heat sink. So the, the little thing, they're on three metal legs and you bend them up, okay? So the board is like this. You bend them up from the board and then you screw them to the heat sink like that. And so the heat comes out of them and goes onto the heat sink and, and convection takes care of it and the fan helps as well. And those heat sinks were slotted so you could draw air through them and, and it was very efficient cooling, super cool design. Or it was called the Viristar SSA64. And then it was the Viristar SSA644. If you Google that right now, you will see pictures of my amplifier. You will probably see me showing it at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest 15 years ago. You, will, you may see pictures of people talking about it or threads, but it was very much on the map. And it, it derived from what was called a uh, AB International 6600 model. That turned, and, and Cinepro had their... 3K6 SE Gold made from a 6600 amp, which had long legacy, and then I turned into the Viristar SSA644. What that is an example of is it's an example of taking an existing circuit, something from long ago, and then you spruce it up a little bit and you rehash it and you just keep selling that circuit. A Class AB amp, you must realize, is an old technology. Class AB has been around a very long time. So a good Class AB design from 30 years ago is still a good Class AB design from right now. So many of these amps, like, for instance, Dan D'Agostino. I look into a D'Agostino, I see old Krell. I go, oh, yeah, I've seen that. I get it. Most of these things, you'll know, they look the freaking same. They have a toroid in the middle. You open up the lid, you're going to see a toroid in the middle, near the front usually, and then you're going to have two boards on the side, one on each side, attached to heat sinks like I was just telling you about, and then you'll have the outputs and crap on the back, and the power supply will be right behind the toroid. will be right here. Power supply is usually right behind it. Then you've got output boards on either side. 
that is a layout from the freaking 19, I don't know, 72 or something like that, 78. It hasn't changed. It's the same layout in the boards. You look at a Griffin today. You look at a D'Agostino. You look at these things that are $250,000. Maybe some of them are less. Maybe they're only $35,000 or $50,000. But they're still the same damn amps, okay? The same damn idea. The same layout. The same concept. There is nothing that is different about them. The only Class AB amp that I have seen that has a different and, and sort of a new take on a breakthrough sort of a way is the Jeff Rowland, which is down here. Jeff continued Class AB. I do not think anybody has loved the Class AB amplifier as much as Jeff Rowland has because he has taken it into the 20th century, 21st century, whatever, 22nd century. He has taken it forward. Um, it does not have a toroid. There's no transformer in a Jeff Rowland 625S2 or the brand new 555. It is as good or in many cases better than the amps with the big ass toroid. Um, it's just simply not needed with the new SMPS switching mode power supplies that are available. You must realize that the SMPS or the switching mode power supply is an area of consumer electronics that has had tons of R&D and focus into improving it. The power supply, more than anything, is the most improved portion of consumer electronics along with Class D, but let's stick with the Class ABs. The only thing that you're gonna see advanced in Class ABs is power supply design, and Jeff Rowland has it in spades over other power supplies. Now, does it mean that it sounds any better than a really well-designed um, old-school power supply? No, not necessarily. It's gonna have, it's gonna be more efficient, that's for sure. It's gonna have a better PSRR. It's gonna have power factor correction, which the old ones probably don't, or if they do, it's archaic. So it's gonna have a more stiff power supply. It's gonna be more efficient, which is really what you want out of a power supply. That means less energy wasted as heat, more energy used instead of just going off as, as heat, okay? The old school amps though, they do sound kick ass and they still do sound kick ass. And there's no reason to change an amplifier if it sounded kick ass in the 1980s. There's no reason to change your circuit and go reinventing the wheel. You just sweeten it. What happens is in the 1970s, the output devices are now obsolete. They used to be these little round metal um, things that look like, they, we used to call them Mexican party hats because they look like they had, they were round with two little tabs that came off and it looked like a hat brim and it said made in Mexico. They were Motorola devices, um, bipolar devices, super cool. But those are, have been phased out and, and replaced by silicon devices that um, perform better. So when the company, as the, 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 the amps get newer, the time passes, material science gets better, um, chips get more efficient, output devices get more efficient, and people need to change their components. They can't use that same regulator that they used in the 80s because it's not made anymore, and now there's a better regulator out. So they make small circuit changes to include the new regulator or the new parts that go obsolete so that now the amp can, you can still find parts for it. Remember, if you're making these things in any sort of quantity, you need to have parts at the part house every time you ask. You can't use something obsolete and weird. Now, some of these guys that hand build stuff can use obsolete and weird uh, parts because they have stashes of them. Now, if you need to replace that part, you're never gonna find that same part at the parts house. You're gonna have to pray and hope that the guy that made the amp still has a stash of those available so you can replace that part. So what I'm getting at is the new amps are just rehashed versions of the older amps, okay? It doesn't mean that they're any worse sounding. What it does mean to me is they're not worth a premium price. There's nothing worth $250,000 in a damn D'Agostino amp to me. It's old ass technology. They already amortized all their R&D for that shit way back when. So they don't need to, and this is what, well, we still need to, you know, there's a lot of R&D that goes into this shit. We need to pay the engineers with bullshit, okay? A class AB, that's already been amortized. It's already been recouped. You've already gotten all your R&D back. Now all you're doing is small changes in the amplifier. So the amp should not be expensive. That is my point here. The amps should not be expensive. You can find something, and I will show you this in the next video, which you will see an amplifier that is $14,000 made in Italy, made just as good as any D'Agostino, as any frickin' um, Constellation, as any um, Griffin, um, 
and any of these other brands that are standard, you know, 19 inch wide um, rack size, shall we say, or normal size stereo amps. And I'm going to show you, I'm not just going to say it, and nobody's paying me to say this. I have no sponsor of this channel or anything like that or this video. I don't have Patreons that I need to respond to or, 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 or kiss their ass because they're paying me. I've got nobody to answer to, okay? Um, um, as far as I know, I'm the only channel on YouTube that is like that. Maybe Shane, an Aussie audiophile, Australian audiophile, um, who is part of our uh, Hi-Fi tribe. Um, I know he's not paid by anybody, but nonetheless, I'm not paid to tell you this shit. I'm just going to point out some stuff because you guys don't get this level of information ever. This is insider's knowledge that I would only know if I had purchased an amp company and ran the damn thing and got my ass kicked for two years. Okay, I know exactly how much it costs to stuff and test a board. I know how much I can tell by the size of the board and what's on it. I can look at it if I open an amplifier and I visually know what it took to make that amp. I know more or less how much that board costs and I can tell if they cut corners or not. That's the other thing. I can look at the metalwork. I can look at the layout. I can look at how things are placed in that amplifier and I can know this is a cheap ass way of putting this together that is just a production piece, a business idea where it's just their, it's like cannon fodder that they're just trying to sell as many as they can and then go on to the newest, bestest thing. Um, or if it's an amp that has legs on it, meaning it's legacy type design. Even if it's old technology, it's still gonna last for 50 years producing beautiful music for you. Just like some of these old Krells. The old stuff was built different, man. Um, stronger. They had more pride. It was just a different thing, man. There's just much more greed in the world now. So people are trying to make stuff as cheap as they can and profit as much as they can. I mean, the, the delta between the production cost and the sales cost has grown exponentially. But I'm going to introduce to you a product where that delta is much closer and you're getting something much closer to the production cost than these crazy pie in the, spy, in the, in the sky brands. So, um, that is upcoming, and um, I just wanted to bring you into the fold a little bit more and let you know about my background. So when I, because you, unless you research me, and you're probably not going to do that, you're not going to know what a badass I am, okay? And I say that tongue-in-cheek. It's just like OCD. I'm not OCD. But um, I do have some cred, and I do have, uh, and it's not because people are paying me, and it's not because I invented a channel that has 200,000 viewers. It's because I've actually owned amplifier manufacturers. I've learned amp manufacturing. I know it firsthand. I signed the freaking checks. I talked with the vendors. I went over designs um, and design changes, and I know how to cut corner to make it cheaper. I never cut corners on my brand. I just always always kept it badass because I figure if I make it better, people will recognize it, and they did. So that's why Industrial Light and Magic used it. That's why uh, Buddy Guy's um, Blues, um, or Buddy, Money Waters or Buddy Guy, I can't remember, it's in Chicago, I think it might be Buddy Guy. But nonetheless, and Frank Zappa, I mean, you know, we have real, we had a great, um, it was a great product, and I kept it that way. So I just wanted to give you that little background before I go into the amp manufacturing and I start telling you about amps. I want you to know who is delivering this, okay? It's not because I read it somewhere. It's not because, you know, any of this shit. It's because I lived it. I learned it. I know it firsthand and it's legit. My knowledge is legit. So I'm going to show you about these amplifiers in the next video. And we're going to start by showing you some of these great names. And then I'm going to show you the one that's made in Italy, that's made it, it, the same or better in some regards, and is one-third of the price of some of these. I'm going to show you an amp made in USA that is 35 grand, that is a very big premium for quote-unquote old-school technology. But I will show you how it differs from the new shit that, that you find that doesn't have the legacy. I'm talking about Viola Labs, which was previously Cello, which was Mark Levinson Audio Systems before that. We're talking Tom Colangelo design. Um, John Curl might have been back there in the day. I don't know exactly who his engineers were, but it was the shit. Cello still is the shit. Now Viola Labs is the shit when you want solid state um, class AB. Granted, it is a premium. It's not as much of a value as the Jeff Rowland is, which is actually more advanced technology. 
Um, and it's not definitely not as much of a value as the $14,000 um, audio analog, but you get what you're paying for. You're paying for legacy, luxury level, bespoke level quality. And I will go into that. So anyways, thanks for joining. And I will see you guys in the next video where we will get in depth. I will open these things up and we will get in depth with these amplifiers because I want to educate you all. I want you guys to see from Mikey's eyes what I see when I look in these things. I'm not just trying to sell the shit. What happens is, just so you guys know, and part of this is me taking you along in how do I choose amplifiers. Um, because I have to choose the brands that I carry. What I do is I order a sample, I get it in, and I look at it. I inspect it front to back. I go over it with a fine tooth comb. Then I listen to it. I let it burn in, and I listen to it for a couple months. And then I decide if I'm going to put my name on the, on, the, on, on the line for this brand, for whatever brand I'm bringing in. Because by the time I bring it in, I am full tilt go. I'm full tilt boogie on the brand. It meets all my standards. It's run through my gauntlet. And I say, I'm willing to sell it and stake my name on it. You have to realize everything I send out, I guarantee is going to not just work. This DOA, um, guaranteed no, no DOA is bullshit. Okay. I guarantee you're going to jizz in your jeans. Okay. How about that? I guarantee that you are going to be thrilled. You're going to absolutely have, you're going to be ecstatic about what you buy from me. You're not just going to, it's not just going to work and be like, oh yeah, it works a little bit better. No, it's going to kill what you have or your money back. So in order for me to do that, I have to be very picky about the brands that I carry. And this is how I decide. So I'm going to take you along on my journey with how do I choose an amplifier to bring to you guys and I'm going to show you exactly what I do, and we're going to go through it together. And these are the things that I do normally, and I don't talk about, but I'm bringing you guys along in the journey so you can see how do I value an amplifier and how do I determine if it's worth it, okay? Because I'm one of those weird guys that needs to sell value along with a product. If you guys want to come and buy a $150,000 amplifier, if it's got no value and it's just a display product, some of the guys on the on the on the Audiogon forums or whatever, they want to just take pictures of it and show it like it's their it's their resume. They don't know two shits about hi-fi, but they sure know how to put together a beautiful looking room and a beautiful looking rig. And you know, to each his own. But I don't serve the display guys. I, I, I serve people that actually want a value and actually want to connect with music on a meaningful level. That's what I purvey. So I'm very picky about the brands. Enough said. So that's coming up. Thanks for joining. See ya.